In this episode, we interview Bianca, founder of the Afro-Socialists and Socialists of Color Caucus and member of NYC DSA. She talks to us about workplace organizing and building solidarity with coalition partners. So I'm just going to start by just asking you to say um, more about you know, yourself and how you got involved in uh, labor organizing. Sure. So um, how I first got involved in labor organizing, for my first, very first job out of college, um, I went uh, to go stay with my parents for a little bit to figure it out. And at the time, um, my dad was enlisted in the Air Force and they were, sca they were um, stationed in Little Rock Air Force Base. And so I went, picked up my stuff, went to Little Rock um, and got a job um, at a Verizon call center. At the time, it was the highest paying job um, in, the ta in the city of Little Rock. Um, I really enjoyed, uh, you know, my job, et cetera. And, you know, I felt like I was fairly compensated for the work I was doing. I was getting like promotions uh, fairly like quickly. Um, it seemed like there was upward mobility in the company. And at that time I wanted to be, uh, you know, I thought I wanted to work for a corporation and like climb up the ladder. Um, there was a point where my parents were retiring um, from the military and they were going to go back to the East Coast, where, where I'm originally from. And so I had asked for a transfer, but they didn't have a call center. And so they transferred me into a retail store in uh, Staten Island. I was living in Brooklyn, working in Staten Island. Um, my commute was like two and a half hours. I went through this like and was asking for a transfer to Brooklyn because there were stores in Brooklyn for me to go to for probably about a year. And so by the time, it took me about a year of fighting. And by the time I got to Brooklyn, I kind of had, um, you know, I was kind of like super alert and kind of like rattled a little bit for how hard I had to fight. Um, and so, you know, I worked in uh, Brooklyn for a while. Uh, I was there for maybe about a year. And in that year, I experienced all kinds of things. Um, I, got, I came into a store that had like a really toxic culture, um, passed down from management, um, it was super competitive um, and the management was abusive. So when I say abusive, what do I mean? I mean, uh, at the time we were just carrying the iPhone. It was like when Verizon first had the iPhone, for instance, this is one example. Um, Verizon was really upset with us that we weren't selling the Android phones because customers just wanted the iPhone. And so they would like discipline us if we would sell an, anything other than an Android phone, um, tell us that they were gonna take away our benefits, um, sit us down on one-on-ones and, and talk to us about how to talk customers out of the phone that they want into the phone. And so it's like years after like just having somebody be like a hawk and watch down on you, we would, we started to call HR. We would all simultaneously take different turns <laughs> calling HR on different days of the week in our store because we were all like, if they knew about this, they would, this is not okay. Like this can't be coming from like, you know, upper management or whatever. Um, then we learned uh, that they didn't care. And in fact, they backed up the managers in the abuse. People would regularly pass out on the floor from anxiety attacks. Um, people uh, would, I mean, people were just like taking time off because they were like just unwell mentally because of the, the, the culture in the store. And the breaking point came for us with the labor, the breaking point came for us whenever we had, we got one of the managers that we didn't really like that was really abusive out and they replaced her with someone else who we thought was like fine until he started sexually harassing all the women in the store. Um, and then we were like, kind of like enough is enough. And so after that experience, I feel like we were really rattled. We, HR did fire him, but by that time we had been abused verbally, um, you know, sexually assaulted, or not assaulted, but sexually, you know, harassed. And um, just like, we were just totally um, beat. I have to say that um, the six months before we organized the union, I was actually off myself on like mental uh, FMLA, trying to get my mental together. I actually felt, I've never felt anything like that before. Um, so when I came back, <laughs> when I came back after six months, I came back into a different store, uh, but I knew all the people um, and, and, and it was a new manager and it was a nice manager and he was, you know, he was great. Um, and then it became, it came time for our annual raises. And um, I remember I had been at this point, probably about five years with Verizon um, uh, in its totality. Um, and I remember him saying, well, you're not getting a raise. You had to take an FMLA leave and, um, sorry, I, I have the budget to give you a 3% raise, but I'm only going to give you 1% because that's what I can do. And I, something in me just snapped. 
And I remember I was sitting at the counter um, in that same time frame, sitting at the counter, and we live in, we're in Brooklyn, and so we're in a, a part of Brooklyn that's like old school Brooklyn, very blue collar. You see, uh, because we work in a Verizon store and the landline is union, um, oftentimes you see the union guys coming in and out, you know, et cetera. Um, we service their accounts. Um, so we saw a guy, big union guy in a jacket. He says, uh, he comes in, oh, have a problem with my phone, blah, blah, blah. So my coworker's helping him, and I said, hey, you're part of the union, aren't you? I see your jacket. And he said, yes, yeah. so. I said, well, you know, when are you guys going to come over here? Because, you know, we're, we'd like to have a union and I don't know what to do. And he was like, I'm not supposed to be talking about uh, to the union, talking about the union to you per our contract. But your local is 1109. You should Google it. Turn around, fix this phone. Like, you know, whatever. And I went and Googled it. And the next day I reached out to them and I said, and I left a message. Um, they sent an organizer a week later that met me in the subway across the street from my store on my lunch break. Um, and the rest was kind of just history. Um, yeah, we went on to build a union campaign. It was really a hard fought, long fought um, battle. Um, but yeah, that's how, those are the conditions that made, pushed me into um, wanting to start a union in the first place. What are, um, can you talk a little bit more about that first one-on-one -on -one with the organizer? Like what stood out to you in that moment? Um, he really asked me to like lay out like why I called him. Um, and I had already been thinking about it. So we were kind of on the same page. Um, I had already said that, you know, I have, I think I have people that are interested in this, for instance, I had already reached out to one of the people I know in each store, one person I know in each store to say, I didn't say I'm calling a union organizer. I said, um, if you wanna learn more about <laughs> changes that we can have, like we can make in the company, um, then let me know. And so I built it from there. And so he just drew all that information out of me. And he talked a lot about his personal experience and how he's dedicated and why he's dedicated to the work. So yeah, he did. He talked about his time, for instance, he was um, organizing one of the organizers with Occupy that participated in Occupy. So he talked, to, he, he connected the struggles that we're seeing um, in our stores, the, the struggles that we're having with our management and with the company, with our, you know, unhappy about the things that we're unhappy about with the reason that people occupied the park. Um, and it was at this time only like two years after um, Occupy Wall Street. And so that to me really resonated. He was able to tell a personal story. And I remember it stick, like really um, making an impression on me because whenever I went back to report um, back to my coworkers about what I talked about with him, they said, how is he? And I said, yo, he seems like the real deal. He slept in the park and Occupy, like he's really gonna be on our side um, because he was able to share that personal information. Um, super down to earth, um, didn't like make me feel bad about not knowing anything um, and just like really met me where I was in the moment. So those are the things that stood out to me and always consistent, always following up um, even more than I probably would have liked. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> so, so how did you like, so from there after basically being trained or getting getting this knowledge and getting this experience from there you organized a, a bunch of stores from what i can from what i can tell am i correct in thinking you organized seven of rising stores and it, so how how did you how did you become like the organizer extraordinaire because that seems like most people if they organize one store they're like oh you know this is this, this is great but uh seven is um a lot how did, how was that this is actually not anything special about me. This is actually, sometimes we say the managers are our best organizers and this is what we mean by this. So what would happen whenever all that terrible behavior that I referred to earlier in the call, uh, when that would happen and people would complain to HR or complain to the district manager, their fix was always to switch you to a different store. And so because this at this uh, behavior was like so rampant <laughs> across the whole all of Brooklyn it means that all of us have worked in several different stores and so there's a, a, a really like high amount of interchange which means we all know each other right because we've all been switched in and out they switch managers you know like oh this manager's you know doing this abuse okay we'll just switch them to another store that's the and so we had all had shared experiences around bad managers around working conditions <laughs> 
So because of this interchange, we already had relationships in every store. And so when I went to go meet the union organizer, I already went and I said, I have seven, six other people besides myself that are interested um, in doing this. And so we actually started the committee with people from the, all those different stores. And it was never a separate thing. I will say, though, that once we started our... Um, once we started to organize and we and, and once we won our election three months later, um, they did in, in Massachusetts, they read about our victory in the union and the fact that we had organized because um, and somehow they had, somebody had read it. And so then they decided to have their own organizing drive in their store in Massachusetts. And then as a result, um, ended up getting in contact with us and we fought uh, embarking our contracts and went on strike side by side. So there was a lot of coordination between um, different parts, stores, for instance, even during our um, election in Brooklyn or during our campaign in Brooklyn, the union put us in touch with people who had tried to do it in California and failed and tried to do it in Illinois and failed. Although they didn't win a union, they still had experience about how the company would react. That was really valuable for us. So it was really like a network of workers who were just kind of supporting each other through this and a case of uh, good timing. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Definitely. Can you tell us a little bit more about getting that organizing committee set up with all of y'all? Like, what did that process look like? And yeah, any kind of advice? So what we would do, so like, like the way that union organizing was back then, I, um, it's a little different than now, but like back then. So back then, we come, I come with the six names, or the six names besides myself. I go report my meeting back to them with the first union organizer. He then says, in a week, let's pick a meeting spot and you bring those people that you feel like, you know, you talk to that are interested in this with me. We have a, a, a meeting the next week. Um, the meeting, the second meeting is instead of one person and is in seven people, right? Um, the union organizer then says the exact same thing to them that he says to me um, and gets in, and does the same exact process with them. He says, we're going to have a meeting in a week. And then so on, every time it doubles. The, the way that we grow is that we talk to people. We have every single meeting. We would sit down and have an assessment. Who is in each store? Who do we think are ones? Who do we think are twos? Who do we think are threes? Ones being we know they're going to be down for the cause. We know they're going to support the union. Two's being, we have no idea about this person. They could go either way, or we just don't know them at all. And three's being, we know those are like super people close to the management. And, you know, those aren't the people that we need to tell about what we're doing in this moment or ever. <laughs> um, and so when you're doing those assessments, you know, once a week and your group is getting larger just by be doing those assessments, because the ones that we come up with, then we're tasked on inviting them to the next meeting, the twos that we come up with, then we're tasked on holding out, but trying to figure out an angle to start a conversation to see if they can be ones or if they will be threes. Mm -hmm. um, and so we did that for um, the better part of a month, I would say, that we were just meeting weekly. We're coming to these meetings, we're building momentum, we're building momentum. What happens is you build momentum for about a month, like I said, until our very last meeting, I think, you know, that's whenever you've called everybody in, you're, you're like, that you think is on your team, and you're like, we've written, you know, our statement about why we want to unionize in the spirit of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the sanitation workers in Memphis, you know, we are going to have a voice and build power and, you know, all these things. Um, and and then you commit and so you commit and you say okay we're gonna file for an election at the national labor relations board what that means is that all of you have signed these cards to say that you want to fi file for a union it's going to be public information um and it's going to be like who signed on to this and it's going to be out and the management will know so we prepare ourselves for this and that means that every single meeting when you invite new people you hear the exact same speech you call it inoculation it means you give you a like a little taste of how the management may react or what's going to happen. You're outlining what the steps are. When you do this, the manager will react like this. When you do that, the manager will say that. This is the playbook. You know, most people don't know management and companies, whether they're, you know, tech companies or they're, you know, fast food restaurants, they all use the same anti-union playbook. They have lawyers that come up with the same exact steps. It doesn't, there's no special thing for a special profession and because it's because it works. But and we have the playbook and we know, right? But 
it's we're trying to inoculate people and prepare them for what will happen because people feel so much more in control and empowered whenever they when you hit them when they expect it right versus whenever you hit them and they didn't expect it i think related to that intimidation um factor so a lot of people are you know bef the reason why they're not even willing to consider unionizing is because of the fear <laughs> fear of what can happen in many cases, you know, fear of what in fact does happen in many cases, whether it's getting fired or just being harassed at your job or your boss making your life just hell for the time you're employed. So could you say something about like, how did you deal with that? How did you and your organized committee like deal with both the fear and the real threats of, you know, they can't actually do things to make your life hard as a worker? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, we we talked about countering what what fear is. Fear is a lack of information. Fear is the, you know, the the thing the tool that the boss uses to that you that to justify, you know, it's it's um treatment of workers. And so like we try to turn the fear into like anger for instance, to say, listen, you're afraid, but what do you have to lose? Already, you know, people are passing out from anxiety attacks. Already, you know, you're getting horrible schedules. Already, you're getting sexually harassed. Already, you're getting locked in inventory rooms because you don't want to sell, you know, you can't sell the phone that they want you to sell and being, you know, uh, threatened. We, one of the things, you know, we, we push back on the narrative of fear is like, what do we have to lose? We worked retail and we work on commission. We're one of the only, you know, every year that I would go get my taxes done, my tax guy would say, you're the only person who makes less money every year because the boss is trying to figure out a way to restructure the commission plan so that we don't make as much money. So it's like, what do we have to lose? And we see the job declining. So we presented it to people who were fearful and saying like, this is a job actually with good benefits or like, this is the best job I ever had. I used to work, you know, at Target or like whatever. We would say like, yes, the union getting things in writing is a way to solidify and freeze the things that you like about what you have right now. It's not about starting from scratch. It's about freezing the things that we have so that they can't take them away because already we've seen that they've taken them away. And so if we get it in writing, they can't do that. This is shifting gears a little bit, but I'd like to, to tie in a little. How did you get involved with the DSA? And from there, how do you see the DSA's role and chapter's roles in la labor organizing, engaging in it, supporting it, all of that good stuff? Yeah, sure. So um, fast forward after we won our contract. Actually, fast forward, whatever. I got fired at some point. <laughs> and um, when I got fired, I got fired for being a union activist. But um, what happened was while we were taking my case to court, I got put in um, the organizing office of my district of the district of my union, CWA, Communication Workers of America. Um, and so, you know, the union rallied around me the day I got fired. Um, you know, the president did an emergency thing and said, we're going to take care of our own. Bianca, you're, we have you, you know, make your same salary, go into the office. And so I went into the office and I was sharing a desk with that same union organizer <laughs> that I met in that subway, um, you know, all those you know, what it, at that point years ago, because um, it took a couple years. So um, I went into the organizers, which you call the war room, and all of a sudden I'm in corner and I have no idea. I put in the office with so people who identify as socialists, um, who are organizers in the labor movement, and they start throwing books at me, um, and <laughs> I, you know, and I'm and I'm and I'm following their lead. Um, about probably about three months in. Uh, three months in, they say, well, we're going to have a meeting. Uh, and I said, okay, uh, we're going to have a meeting. All right. And stay after work today. I said, okay, fine. Uh, they had been doing these reading groups called the Project for Working Class Power. So I had already kind of like um, went to those and it was like a group of union members who would come together on like a weekday night and talk about capitalism and talk about, you know, uh, corporations and the 1% and all the Occupy stuff, right? Um, so I, and I had said, you know, I'm not coming to your reading group anymore. You know, it's, you guys are always talking about the same thing. I want I want action. You're giving me all these books about revolution. I want action. Call me when it's time to take action. At that point, we were mobilizing in the street for a movement for like Black Lives Matter around Eric Garner and stuff. But I would say that it seemed really divorced from anything in the labor movement for me personally. And also it seemed, um, and it also wasn't consistent, right? It wasn't anything that I was a part of organizing. Like I wasn't 
um, in that. So uh, they stay after work for the meeting, meaning some nurses show up from New York State Nurses Association. I know some other of the, you know, staff people are staying. So they said, Maria Sfart, who's the director of DSA is in the corner in the boardroom. And they say, well, we're, we called you all here today because we think that we want to, now that Bernie's over, because that was after 2000, you know, the 2016 run, now that Bernie's over, he's lost, we can all, st like, we need to figure out a way to capture this momentum. We can't let this momentum die. And so we're trying to figure out a way to turn this into an organization. We're thinking about organizing under the umbrella of the DSA, which was at that time in New York's completely, like, pretty much defunct. Um, you know, old, the older folks had bet you were there, but there was no activity or, you know, anything. Um, and so they said, well, we're here because we think that, you know, we could do a revitalization of the New York City DSA chapter. Um, and we can create a branch that's just for labor. <laughs> and I said, I don't even know, I didn't even know what that meant. And then in the meeting, they said, well, you should be the coach, you should be the chair of the labor branch. And I'm like, no, I don't even know what that means. But we all joined DSA that day. <laughs> and then the rest is history. We kind of, I was the chair of the labor branch for the first two years. We built out um, a project that was meant to answer um, to social justice issues and time and, and, and issues of the time without having to wait for labor bureaucracy to approve it. Um, we wanted to act as labor on our own. And I feel like we've done uh, a decent job of that um, thus far. Um, I think DSA, I think, you know, I would say this, I do hear the other side of the argument that says that only 6% um, percent of the private sector is unionized, that what are, what is the other 94% of, how is this relevant to the rest of us and about, you know, how, um, you know, they feel like the labor movement is, could be reactionary, et cetera. I, I, I get all of that. But I also do agree with the arguments that the labor movement has the infrastructure that we need. We don't need to start over from scratch. They have an infrastructure. It's a matter of leadership less so than anything else, you know, a matter of leadership and a matter of a grassroots, uh, you know, a rank and file uh, uprising. So um, I think the project has been going great, but I think that because it takes a lot of, some people a longer time to understand what the project is, it's been, um, you know, a little bit slower uh, than we would have liked. I feel like it can be hard to make the connection sometimes with the, because the work that's done in the labor part is so specific to your work site, you know, right? Like mm -hmm. you're, 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 most of it includes you trying to organize the people that you work around every single day, the people that you, you know, encounter and share an experience with. And so whenever you have people like an organization like DSA that has a mix, there can be a, um, a disconnect sometimes, I think, or it could be hard to connect the dots for people who have never had a union job, you know, um, and aren't familiar with that, with, with, the, with those dynamics. Um, but um, I think DSA is playing the role that it should play, which is um, working with rank and file activists, um, lending, learning from organizers, sharing experiences. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm most, so the, 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 the roots of the DSA here, the group that was the original, you know, revitalizers or whatever you want to call it of the chapter, were folks who were adopting Verizon wireless picket lines whenever we were on strike. We were on strike for 49 days and that shit is tiring, I have to tell you, um, to be screaming to the top of your lungs, walking in circles every day. It's more work than work. Um, and, you know, we were doing that through the summer. It was, it was tiring. And so, you know, some of those folks, you know, adopted a store and they would take a shift. They, they would take an afternoon where we can ensure that there was still a picket line, there's still a community presence, and a pre but we can have the day off or, you know, have the afternoon off. That was really important. We also did some really important solidarity work um, in 2017 with the largest to date uh, retail strike in the United States with the AT&T mobility strike. They went on strike for three days. Uh, we had, uh, within a day, uh, I had to put a call out to every single chapter that I can get uh, in touch with to say, can you put bodies on the AT&T picket line? Because these are smaller stores, right? You have a store of like 10 workers. It's really hard to build a picket line off of 10 workers, especially when these workers have never been on strike before, right? Um, and so uh, DSA covered 166 picket lines um, across the country. We covered, we showed up more than the AFL-CIO um, and our union was, uh, had to give a shout out and say Democratic Socialists of America just because of the overwhelming presence that we had 
um, nationwide um, because there was a there was a strike in almost every state except for the South. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm really glad you brought up the AT and T protest because you know here in North Carolina that was a huge thing to happen here. Um, we actually had you know strikes and had our members going out to the picket lines at like 7:30 in the morning, which can be a lot for uh, us grad student types, but um, but I definitely found it to to be one of the most energizing things that we were able to do for our new chapter and definitely built solidarity in a more concrete way, ways that we could see. Uh, I think we talk about solidarity a lot, but sometimes it's hard to see what does that really mean and what does that look like? Um, so can you tell us a little bit about what building solidarity could look like um, and some more concrete kind of ways we could try to build solidarity with each other? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'll just tell a story first. Um, okay. There's an organization called Teamsters for a Democratic Union, which is a reform group inside of the Teamsters uh, Union. And um, we have some members that were close in the labor branch to them. And I remember we took a position and we wanted to throw a fundraiser for them. Um, and so we turned out members to a fundraiser they were having and some people were upset, but other people were fine with it. Long story short, we, we throw this fundraiser with all these Teamsters. Uh, it was great. <laughs> and a couple weeks later, maybe maybe even a month later, a month later, I'm canvassing in the rain for our Democratic Socialist candidate for State Senate, Julia Salazar. And, you know, in New York, it's always really hard because all the doors are locked in the buildings. So you have to wait for somebody to come in and out. But then when it's pouring rain, it's like, oh, somebody got to come in and out. It was the first day of canvassing. So it was the launch. And we were really trying to like, you know, we had a lot of energy and we we're trying to be out there and in spite of the rain. And I never forget, UPS truck rolls up guy gets out hey you from the dsa I said, yeah i'm from the dsa he said i got keys to all these buildings i'm gonna let you in all of the buildings on the block we fuck with dsa and i'm like <laughs> he's like don't tell anybody i did that just call me tommy the teamster that <laughs> solidarity because we were able to stand with them in a fundraiser something so small got us into every single building and actually made an impression in this worker's mind where yes i the dsa is on our side I see so many, I think that those acts of solidarity are so easy, just easily like doing turnout to other people's events and not centering ourselves. I can talk about like, you know, I talk often about how we enter into coalition spaces. One of the things that we see whenever we were first building this thing is that, you know, got people would come in and think that entering a coalition space means bringing your own lid and, you know, having your organization's shirt on and the hat, you know, and the whole thing. And just, I'm from the DSA, I'm from the DSA. It's so off-putting. Mm -hmm. It's so not the way to build solidarity. It's not authentic. And it always, always, always will blow up in your face. I feel like the way that we enter coalition spaces is silently wanting to learn, wanting to listen and getting a, a real assessment. We shouldn't even be wanting to say who we are, you know, at the moment. We should be wanting to be neutral people in a space that can have the, um, you know, the in a space that can have the, the ability to assess where people are at from different places, what uh, our role or what, how, what is our position and compared to you know, everyone else's as far as life experience or what we're bringing to this coalition, et cetera. I just think that there's so much um, to learn first. And so, you know, like I'll say when we built, I mentioned the Right to Know Act was our first initiative, but when we were building those relationships with our Black Lives Matter Greater New York chapter, I went to the meetings for like a year <laughs> silently, participated in marches as an individual. Yes, I'm the chairperson of blah, 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 blah. Who cares? I'm here as an individual. And it's so funny. So uh, a year after I was going to those things, they knew me, but they just, I never said where I was from. They messaged me on the CSA page and said, hey, we want to start to build relationships. Can you send can somebody meet with us to talk to us? Well, who do they call? They said, Bianca. And I went with the, at the time, chair of the, the thing. And I walked in and the guy was so blown away. Like, you're the DSA? And I'm like, yes. And he's like, I had no idea. And, and it's just like, I'm not, that's a little bit dramatic. You don't need to take a year, but it's just an example. And like, to this day, the relationship is solid because like, I enter that space as the DSA. I enter that space as a human that's concerned with the same things that the people in this coalition are concerned about, right? right. Um, yeah, so I, and I just think that another thing to understand in coalition spaces is that read the room, 
<laughs> read the room, read the room, read the room. Like I know that a lot of times when we're in coalition spaces, the coalition more liberal, a little bit more probably center center than we'd like, I, I'm assuming, um, is probably the most common experience. I would just say that, um, you know, navigate the organization, navigate that space in a way <laughs> that you can understand how to meet people where they're at, but still stay true to what, you know, this organization believes in. And I think there's a way to do both things. And so I don't think that we should go in, you know, being right and, you know, prescriptive and, you know, beating people down with what we think is the truth. And I also don't think that we should go in tiptoeing around, you know, and not being true or transparent about what it is that we believe and why we believe it. And I, I think there's a balance um, to, for people to approach it with. Um, and I also think that, you know, if you're entering a coalition space in DSA in this moment, it can be really hard for you to remember a time when we weren't liked, when we were disregarded, when we were ignored, when people didn't want us in the room. Mm -hmm. And now I know that we particularly are experiencing this in New York now because we've built so much power politically through campaigns, through elections, et cetera. Now it's like that there, I have to still remind people, it's yeah, we have a seat at the table now because we have forced our way to this table, not because they are welcoming us to this table, not because they want us at this table. And as a matter of fact, that the first opportunity to get us out of this room, <laughs> they will. And it's okay. And you can still be friendly and okay and present with people and work together and understand that you will not be liked. We are not here to be liked. We are here to make change, systemic change. And so, yeah. Like, I think it's really good, cool how you point out that, you know, you didn't come into Black Lives Matter spaces saying, hey, I'm DSA, um, you know, let's be in coalition partners, you know, from day one, or you weren't really pushy about it, you were just coming to their spaces um, as someone who's working within Black Lives Matter, as opposed to just a DSA member coming to see if they can build some relationship quickly so that then they can mobilize the people with Black Lives Matter events to their events or something like that, where you, yeah, you actually, you know, spend some genuine time to get to know the organization and to meet the people in it. Um, I think that's, I think that's important to emphasize because um, like you, like you definitely know, coalition work is pretty tricky and there are bad ways to do it. <laughs> um, there's like ways to microwave coalition relationships and that's just not gonna, that's just not gonna happen. Um, it's gonna have to be something that's long term. And even, even if it's long term, like you said, you know, the, it's still gonna be something you have to, I guess, continually earn your place and continually do work, um, as opposed to, I guess, rest on your laurels with the relationship as it's been developed, um, and just play off of that. I wanted to, I want to ask you, like, about coalition work with respect to, um, so, okay, so let me take a step back. So a DSA is a very white organization. Um, that's, uh, that's, that, that's something that that's, that's the case. Um, and, you know, because of that, it kind of limits DSA's ability to take lead on certain kinds of work. Um, it would be very strange. It would, it would not look good for DSA to take to, to a very white organ, majority white organization from a very specific democrat uh, demographic to take a uh, lead on certain kinds of work, particularly involving like police brutality or police abolition, prison abolition, that kind of stuff. I was uh, wondering what your thoughts were about like. Um, people talk about, oh, DSA being in, B DSA should be in coalition with um, groups that are, uh, 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 political groups that are led by people of color. And what do you, like, what do you think about that? How does that, how does that go? Like, what does that look like in your mind? And what would be, yeah, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? I guess I'll go ahead. Oh, okay. So, yeah. DSA should be in coalition with people who are rooted in the community. I agree with that. I think we all agree with that. I think the problem is, is that for some reason, there's like a dynamic in DSA. <laughs> Maybe it's the age thing. I'm not sure that very few of the times are we actually from the communities that were in these DSA chapters. For instance, in New York, I can't, I mean, I know this is New York, but there's like, probably I would venture to say 80% that might be a little high but you know de definitely not 
more, I mean, definitely more than half, I think, are not even from the city. And so that already makes you, you know, makes people kind of look at you like, you know, are you just here for now? Um, you know, are you really committed, you know, to this, you know, place, right? And to this neighborhood and really building, are you invested? Do we have the same interests? That's what we're trying to figure out, right? Do we have the same interests? Um, and I think that ultimately the only way to prove that is by sh continuing to show up and shut up, um, like I said. Um, I am not advocating that anybody take, you know, any type of abuse. So I'll say this, it's been, tr it's tricky to man, it's tricky to, to navigate those coalition spaces, particularly if you are a majority white group, you know, trying to work with, um, you know, a POC or black led uh, organization. I feel like there's a couple ways it plays out. So hopefully that you are both committed, you know, you can talk about why you want to be in coalition with one another and how you believe in a multiracial, um, you know, movement um, and how we want to show solidarity, not allyship, not white guilt, but how you want to show solidarity and why actually that you're have like an, like what's your common interest, you know, with, you want to dismantle white supremacy? That sounds really weird for somebody who, has privilege, you know, has privilege off of white supremacy. Wouldn't that make anybody, you know, kind of think twice? Like, well, what, it, what, well, why, you know, why? and so I think that like taking the time to go through, you know, why it is that you want to work together. I also think that there could be situations that we've seen particularly in New York where um, groups that, you know, are led by POC or, you know, have a majority of POC think that DSA is like a punching bag and that they can just abuse them. And that's not the case either. And I don't ever advocate that anybody, you know, take that kind of behavior where people are weaponizing, you know, their experience or their identity against you uh, when you're well-meaning uh, and, and, and doing the right thing. And if you're wrong, then you're wrong, you know, whatever. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think, I think I think it could be really I think it could be really tricky. I think it could be done. I think that you just need to say from the offset that you're both committed to the same things and why you want to be and what each of you have to bring um, to the cause or you know to the to the thing that you're trying to because these coalition spaces are normally based off of a campaign, right? So it's not um, you know ideally it's a long relationship but it's not all sometimes they end with the campaign and sometimes you're able to revive them for different campaigns that's ideally what you would want um but yeah i think getting it straight in the offset is what i'd say thank you so much bianca i really hope we get a chance to talk to you more in the future because i have like a million more questions i want to ask <laughs>